How are we this morning? Good. Well, I'm glad that you ventured out on the roads to get here. Hopefully they were not too bad getting up here. Everybody have a good Christmas? Yes. So here's, here's what happens. You drop uh, a little comment in a sermon about being okay with getting socks, and you get given like four pairs of socks, which is pretty cool. So then on Facebook, somebody was like, well, you should ask for a car. And I'm like, great, yeah, I'll take a car. And uh, Donna Lynette Kelly gave me a car this morning. Might have only been that big, but still. <coughs> so we'll see how long this goes on. I might ask for a million dollars and see how that goes. Uh, so I hope your Christmas was good. Uh, ours was good. We went over to my mom's house in Scotts Bluff and hung out with my family for a few days. My wife is up in uh, Riverton with her family right now. I'm going there this afternoon uh, to spend New Year's with uh, with them. But we're kind of now in this time of year where, you know, you quickly move from Christmas on to New Year's and we start thinking about 2020. If you can believe it or not, it'll be here in just a few days, right? Are you ready for it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's about the best you can get out of that, right? Yeah, I hope that you're, I hope that you're ready for 2020 and I hope you're ready for uh, making 2020 uh, the best year that you can. Uh, we kind of get in this, this time of year and we start thinking about, well, what happened in 2019? You know, what was good? What was bad? You know, for us personally, we, we had just a lot of things that we were dealing with because of other things that happened over the last couple of years, uh, some of you probably know about. And, and, and so we we're just kind of recovering and working through some issues that we needed to work through. And I'm looking at 2020 now going, man, I, I want to create some good, healthy habits in my life. And I want to create some positive things in my life and in my family, and, and I don't know about you are, you, are you a type of person that makes resolutions? Like anybody here, a resolutions person? No? Somewhat, yeah, maybe. I, you know, I, I, I think that any time of the year you can decide just to make positive change and, and create healthy habits or whatever that is for you, but, but I think it's important for us as we kind of transition and, and use this time as a way to look back over 2019 but also look forward into 2020, we can kind of capitalize on this time and, and go, maybe there are some things that we should reevaluate in our lives. And there's some things that maybe we should even change. And there's a lot of things that we can, we can talk about. We can talk about our health. We can talk about our education. We can talk about just things that we do with our families. I think most important, as we're looking at possibly making changes in the new year, I think most importantly, we need to look at what God wants to do inside of each of us. And I think that we need to take this time that we have here in this, in this Sunday between Christmas and, and New Year's and really just ask the question, are, are we following Christ the way that he's called us to follow? Are, are we living the life that he's called us to live? Because as you look through Scripture, God really uh, paints a picture of what following him looks like clearly. And so as we read through the Bible, there's, there's some clear pictures uh, of what followers of Jesus really are. And so we want to just dive into a few of these this morning uh, and, and just kind of hopefully paint this picture of what followers of Jesus are supposed to be. Uh, and and these, these are things that the writers talk about as most important elements in our lives. And so we're just going to look at a few of these together and then hopefully walk into 2020 challenged, excuse me, in our faith and challenged to follow Jesus closer in our lives. So we want to just walk through a few of these. If you have your bulletin, it's outlined there for you what scriptures we're going to be. We're going to start with Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, uh, Jesus is in the midst of a, a popular time in his life. The cr crowds are gathering and, and following him and, and want to hear him and, and want to be near him. And, and earlier in this chapter, Jesus feeds 4,000 people on the side of the hill, right? And, and he's done some teaching that... that uh, has, has come about as well, and he goes into this section in Mark chapter 8 here towards the end of the chapter, and it, and it says this, starting in verse 34. It says, Summoning the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life uh, because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? What can a man give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in, his, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man 
will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And Jesus is laying out here in these, in these passages what is expected of people who follow him. Like he's, he's just laying it out here for him. And it's really an invitation to join him in, in what's really coming for him down the road. And of course, we know how this goes, right? Like, put yourself alongside Jesus and what he's going to experience. Because what he's referring to here is that one day down the road, Jesus is going to be carrying his cross that's leading to his death, right? Like, he's forced to carry his own cross, the thing that's ultimately going to, to kill him, that's going to be his death. And he's inviting us to do the same. He's inviting us to join him in that. And, and he explains it there going on, verse 35, he says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. Jesus is talking really about what is priorities in our life. What are the priorities in our life? Like, like most, if not all of us, are never going to be in a place, right, where, where we are going to have to choose between following Jesus and, and, and death or, you know, forsaking that. Like, we're never going to be in that place here. Like, we are given freedoms to, to, to believe what, whatever we want to believe, but the temptation for us is, is to rearrange our priorities, I think, and, and put Jesus in a lower place than we should. The temptation for all of us is to try and gain the world and maybe forsake our relationship with Jesus, to do everything we can to do things like build up our own personal kingdom, to, to gain uh, everything that we want, to live for ourselves, to live for our own desires, to, to gain uh, the promotions, to make more money, to uh, achieve that status or that award, to gain the world, Jesus says. The temptation for us is to build our own kingdoms here on this world, in this world, but this isn't what Jesus is calling his people to do. This isn't what Jesus is calling us to be. Like, like you can try to follow Jesus and get all that other stuff, in fact, I would say that the majority of believers in America probably try to do this. Like, you can try to have the best of both worlds, but your priorities will show you otherwise. Your priorities will show you otherwise. Your life will be defined by how you spend your time and your energy and your money and what other, res other resources that you have. Don't miss that. Your life will be defined by how you spend your time in your energy, and your money, and your resources. That's what defines us. And so as we look to 2020 and we look back at 2019, we kind of have to ask the question, what have your priorities been? I mean, what have you really spent your time and your money and your resources on? And that's easy to do. Like, like, like that's, it's easy to track. Like, we could easily look back over 2019 and maybe even jot down some notes of, man, I did, I did a lot of really chasing the dollar. I, did, I really pursued that promotion this year. Man, I, I really spent a lot of time on my education. Or man, I spent a lot of money uh, on, on chasing this other thing or building this other thing. And I, I think it's easy for us to look back at that and go, man, I was kind of out of whack in 2019. In fact, I would challenge you to do that sometime in the coming days. Just look back at how you used your resources in 2019. How did you use your money? How did you spend your time? Was it for building up the kingdom of God, or was it for building up the kingdom of, of Matt, or of you, or of somebody else? Jesus is calling us as his people to reprioritize, reprioritize our lives. He's calling us to, to, to give our life to him, to surrender our life to him, and what he desires for us, what he calls us to do. Jesus is calling us to live a life of following him and listening to to him and being obedient to him and what he desires for us within this world, no matter what it costs us, calling us to reprioritize our lives. Let's look at another principle this morning. All of these passages are going to be pretty well known for us uh, if you've spent any time in the church and in the Bible. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 is another well-known passage. Jesus here is leaving uh, his last message really with the disciples uh, before he goes uh, up into heaven again. And we read this in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18. It says, Then Jesus came near to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end 
of the age. This is Jesus' command, last command really to his disciples before he, he leaves and kind of sends them out to start the church. And he says, go and make disciples. And you do this by baptizing them and teaching them uh, about me. And, and it's kind of interesting when you really dive into this. And I know I've, I've mentioned this before here as well. Like when you really dive into uh, the translation of the word go here and you get into the Greek word behind it. It really is not like a one-time, hey, you need to go one time here and you need to make disciples. It really is an ongoing, as you are going about your life, make disciples. As you are living out your life, make disciples. As you are going to work, make disciples. As, as you are interacting with your family, make disciples. As you are doing the things that you do, as you go to your, your kids' uh, sporting events, make disciples. As you are coaching, as you are teaching, as you are leading things, as you are getting involved, make disciples. And here's the reality, like this was not a suggestion from Jesus. Jesus didn't go to these guys and say, you know what, you 11 guys, you know, I, I'm kind of commissioning you to go, go start the church. And so if you want, you know, whenever you're ready, make disciples. If you feel like it, make disciples. That's not what Jesus is saying here. It's not, it's not a suggestion. The whole church here in Matthew chapter 28 in the first century, the whole church hinged on these guys being completely committed to making disciples in the world around them. Like the whole thing hinged on that. Like we would not be here 2,000 years later if they would have taken this casually and said, yeah, I might get around to that sometime. Yeah, I might fit that into my schedule sometime. Yeah, I mean, if, if I don't feel too pressured or if I don't feel too awkward or if, if the risk is low enough for me, I might do that sometime. They... They didn't approach it that way. They were totally committed to it. They were bought into it. They understood Jesus was not suggesting this, that they would hopefully get around to it. He wasn't saying to go about it when it was convenient. He was saying, this is a command that I give you, go and make disciples, because the future of Christianity depends on it. The future of Christianity depended on it. And, and Jesus was telling them, and he's telling us to make disciples. It's not a suggestion for us. As much as we want to take verses like this lightly, this is not a suggestion for this. If you are a follower of Jesus, your command in Matthew 28 is the same as it was 2,000 years ago for them. Jesus is telling us to go and make disciples, period. So as we are living our lives, as we're going to work or to school or whatever we do, we are to make disciples around us. We're, po we're to point people towards Jesus. We are to connect people to Jesus. We are to have a part in building God's kingdom here on this earth, and we have a part of that. Let's continue on. Let's jump up to Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 18. There's another pretty well-known passage we've camped on several times, and we'll continue to do so. It says this, as, as Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Follow me, he told, he told them, and I will make you fish for people Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his, son, and his brother, John. And they were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, uh, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And so here again, Jesus is really outlining for us, and he's calling his people uh, to do what he's called them to do and, do and to live out what he's called them to live out. And, and so much of this is similar to the other passages that we've talked about, the other couple passages this morning. Like they all kind of center around the same basic thing. Jesus is calling people not to just sporadically follow him. He, he's not calling people just to, just to you know, do what, what Jesus asks when they feel like it. Like, Jesus isn't calling them to, to kind of randomly go through the motions or to look good. He's not even calling them just to, just to show up and be present, and that's it. Jesus is calling people to be active in their faith, to actively follow him, to actively live this out. And here it's emphasized in verse 19, if we can go back to that there, Lynette. Verse 19 says, follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. There is a progression here that I think Jesus intentionally did that we need, to, we need to not miss. Like Jesus is outlining a process here for us. He starts off by saying, follow me. He, he, he casts this invitation. Hey, come follow me. 
Come do something different with your life. Come live a different life. Jesus is saying, put your hope and your faith and your trust in me, Jesus is saying. Come follow me, Jesus says. And then he transitions and he says, and let me transform your life. He says, and I will make you. Jesus begins transforming our lives. And many of us have seen this, right? Like, as we follow Jesus, our lives are transformed. Like, we are different now than we were before. Like, Jesus has changed our lives. And we don't force this. You can't just, like, read a book and suddenly your life is totally different. Like it's a progression that takes time. Jesus changes our hearts and lives as we follow him. And we want to, and we see a a transformation in how we, how we live. We see transformation in how we think. We see a transformation in our relationships. Like we see a transformation in everything that we do because of the proximity that we have next to Jesus, because we're close to him, because we're following him. And so Jesus says, follow me. He gives the invitation. He says, I will make you. He gives this invitation to be changed by him. And then that transformation leads to a new way of of operating in our lives. Jesus says, I will make you fish for people. I will give you a new purpose for your life. I will give you a new vision for for your life. I will take your eyes off of yourself and achieving only your own goals and your own priorities and the things that you want and and your desires will be off of yourself and your wants will be off yourself and they're put on other people and reaching other people for Christ. And Jesus takes our priorities and he says, you know what, You, you, you chasing your own desires is not enough. Let's chase after people for me, Jesus says. And it's put on other people. We begin fishing for other people. We begin making disciples, is what Jesus says. We focus on building relationships with other people for the purpose of pointing them towards Jesus. This is what he's calling us to do as we follow him. And then finally, I want to point you to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 this morning. If I had to pick a favorite verse, and I've talked about this again, like none of this is really new information. If I had to pick a favorite verse, verse throughout, throughout scripture, it would be found in these, in these verses following. In fact, if I had to pick a favorite character, and Jesus wasn't really an option because that's a Sunday school answer, I would probably pick John the Baptist. Like, like I just love him as a character. He seemed to be a pretty straight shooter. Like, he told it how it was. He was a little rough around the edges, which I kind of appreciate. Like, you don't get the sense that his life was completely perfect and all together and, and kind of well kept. Like, like, he was just kind of rough, and, and, and he even had doubts about Christ at times. You read about it, and, and yet he still remained faithful to Jesus. And so I, I really appreciate John the Baptist throughout Scripture. And so at, at this point in time, we look at John chapter 3, and, and John has been out kind of speaking about how Jesus was coming. And he's preparing the way for Jesus to step onto the scene. He's, he's kind of getting people excited. He has been baptizing. He has been preaching about forgiveness, and he has gained quite a following of people behind him like thousands and thousands of people are coming to listen to him talk about jesus but then something changes right like jesus steps onto the scene and like john's world changes at this point and 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 really jesus has been pretty low-key until this point but people are starting to flock to him once he starts stepping onto the scene and they start going to him instead of john the baptist which causes a little bit of a, a struggle with john's disciples that we read about here In John chapter 3, starting in verse 26, it says, So they, meaning John's disciples, came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and the one uh, and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is flocking to him. Like, uh uh-oh, they're going to him instead of you. Like the one that you pointed to, the one that you said is coming, they're going to him instead of you. And John responded, No one can receive a single thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend, who stands by and listens for him, rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. And this is my verse, verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. John lived his entire life doing something that most of us, I would say, probably don't do. John lived his entire life pointing to somebody else. John lived his entire life making somebody else famous. John lived his entire life 
trying to make somebody else gain ground so that he could get out of the way and, and Jesus could come in. John lived his entire life making somebody else famous, more famous than himself, and, and he didn't claim to be the Messiah. He was just some guy that was kind of out in front saying, hey, watch for this guy that's coming. John lived his entire life doing this. And, and the culmination of John's life is wrapped up, I believe, in verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. And I think John knew something that we all can learn from here. Like John knew that there's no way for Jesus to increase. There's no way for Jesus to become famous if John is also chasing, to be chasing that famous thing for himself as well. And I think we can learn something from that. So many times we want to have both. So many times we want to live in both worlds. We want to have Jesus like it's a good like eternal life insurance plan for us. Like it's a get out of fire free card. But we also want to have everything that the world can give us as well. We want to chase fame. We want to chase success. We want to chase all these things that make us feel good. In reality, we in our, in our lives cannot make Jesus famous if we are also trying to gain fame ourselves. In order to make Jesus increase, in order to make Jesus famous, we have to decrease ourselves. We have to decrease our priorities. We have to decrease what we desire personally for this, for ourselves. So I think it's so important for us to think about some of these things this time of year. I think it's important for us to, to look at our lives and look at our relationship with Jesus and evaluate how, how we're doing during this time of, of new, newness, as in just a few, in just a few days we're going to have a new year, 2020. And during this time of newness, we get a chance to kind of look back and evaluate our lives. We get to look back and evaluate where we've been. And before we jump into changing things, in order, uh, in, in, before we jump into making resolutions, man, I hope that we would individually look at, at who we want to be. And not just as people, but in our relationship with Jesus. Are we where we want to be? Are we following Jesus the way that we want to follow? Is our relationship with him where we want it to be? Because it looks different for all of us. Like there's no cookie cutter thing to this. Like, like what works for me and what I need in my life is not the same as what you need in your life. It looks different for us depending on where we're at. And here's reality. Like I'm talking to believers, right? Like I'm talking to the majority of us in this room who, who have been following Jesus for most, most of our lives. Like, I'm, that's who I'm talking to. At least at some point you made a decision to receive salvation through Christ. And so if that's you, i, I got to ask some questions as we move into the new year. I want to challenge you in these questions. Like, are you, are you who you want to be? And is your relationship with Jesus where you want it to be? Are you living the way that you committed to when you accepted salvation from, from God? Are you really living that life? Because it's tempting for us just to look at our relationship with Christ as a, as a means not to receive God's wrath at times. Like, it's easy for us to do that. And while, while that's true, at, at, some, at some times we don't remember that when we accepted Christ, we also committed to following him and, and being who he calls us to be. Like, those two things go hand in hand. When we follow Jesus, we follow and listen and obey him. And these are just some of the things that, that he commands us to do. And so the question for us is, am I living out what Jesus has called me to live? Am I, am I living out the, the life that he's called us to live? Am I, am I living a life surrendered to Christ and, and doing what he's called me to do, even when it's hard, even when it maybe interrupts my schedule, even when it's inconvenient, even when it makes me a little less famous in order to make Jesus more? Do I have the priority of making disciples in my life? Like, is that a real priority for me, or is that just something that we might get around to? someday? Am I living my life as somebody who is always pointing people towards Christ? Am I making Jesus famous? If not, then what changes do I need to make? What changes do I need to make in my life? What resolutions, what steps do I need to take in order to correct it? Who do I need to ask to get involved in my life? Who do I need to ask to, to mentor me, to disciple me so that I can grow? Who do I need to ask to get involved in their life so that I can help them grow? What changes do I need to make in my life, in my personal study time, in my marriage, 
in my family, in my work, in my social life, and in, in, in my volunteerism, and how I'm spending my time. What changes do I need to make? Because here's the reality, how you respond to this, it's not just you, it affects the community as well. It affects, it affects all of us. Like, like me becoming a better follower of Jesus affects you, and you becoming a better follower of Jesus affects me. We are in this together, but it has to start with us personally. It has to start with us personally. As we, as we spend the next couple weeks looking at us as a church, as a whole, and what this past year has looked like for us, and where God is, called, is calling us to go in the future, we can get caught up with that and just think, oh yeah, the church needs to do this, and yeah, we as a church need to go do this, and we need to be more about this. In reality, the church can't do anything unless it, you know, all the people that make up it are also doing those things personally. It has to start with us personally. The church, and I'm not just talking about North Christian Church, I'm talking about the C, big C church around this world. The church needs people who are committed to Jesus more than just sitting in a seat on Sunday morning. The, the church needs people who are committed to going out as they are living their lives and making disciples. The church needs people who are making more of Jesus and less of themselves. It starts with us personally. It starts with us personally making this decision that in 2020, I'm going to make this year the best year ever. That I'm going to make this the best year ever as I follow Jesus. That I'm going to be more committed to him and more committed to listening to him and following him and more involved in making disciples around me and more consistently looking to make Jesus famous around me. Church, it starts with us personally. I want to be intentional about how, how I spend this next year. I want to be intentional about the decisions I make. I want to be intentional about how I spend my time and how I spend my resources and, and, and what I do. I challenge you to, to, to do the same. Be intentional about what you do in 2020. Be intentional about how you pursue Jesus in 2020. Let's be intentional about spending time connecting people to Jesus and to each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for, uh, for this, just this opportunity that we get to be here. Thank you that uh, this morning we had the opportunity to drive on roads that were cleared off, park in a parking lot that was clear for us and come to a warm building that protects us from the wind and from the cold so that we can come here and that we can worship, that we can open your word, God. And I pray as we are entering the fall, the, just the last days of this year, and looking to next year, God, I pray that we would not just, just quickly move past this, but we would take inventory of our lives, that we would take inventory of our relationship with you and ask difficult questions about how we have lived our life in 2019 and what you are calling us to do in 2020. God, I pray that we would, that, that we would not just leave it here at this time, but we would take some of these passages with us this week and we would put this next to our lives and ask, am I truly making disciples in my life? Am I truly surrendering my life to being, to, to following you, to being changed by you, and to, to reaching other people for you? Am I truly making more of you and less of myself? Heavenly Father, let this be what identifies us in 2020, that we pursue you hard, that we follow you hard, that nothing else is more important than growing in our relationship with you. God, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for everything he did for us on the cross. And I pray this in his name. Amen.